Um, today, my um, partner, um, Patricia Cyrus, and I would like to discuss um, a new result based on some old evidence, which addresses um, a very long and uh, important problem in consciousness. Before we do, I'd like to, um, on behalf of Patricia and I and me, um, thank a few people. First of all, uh, Thomas for putting on a wonderful conference so far and for the kind invitation to speak here. Um, I'd like to st thank Stuart for his leadership in this um, revolution which is unfolding and for his... <laughs> and I'd also like to thank Sir Roger Penrose for um, inspiring this talk. The outline of the talk is um, fairly straightforward. First, I'd like to just um, discuss briefly the materialistic point of view of um, neuroscience and then computers and algorithms, um, <clears throat> the nature of non-algorithmic thinking, uh, retroactivity both in physics and in consciousness, and then some precognition experiments. These have gone back quite a ways, at least 30 or 40 years. Um, Radin, May, Bem, um, Bierman are our principals here. And then talk about um, one particular um, set of experiments um, by Cyrus and um, uh, Dale Graff and show that um, precognition is uh, a prima facie case. It's experimental evidence for non-algorithmic thinking. And then this leads to a possible new kind of Turing test that AI should not be able to beat. So to begin, I'd like to quote from uh, David Chalmers. This is in response to um, the first book that, um, uh, that Roger wrote concerning the mind, The Emperor's New Mind in 1989. In response to that, there was a good deal of um, discussion and um, one of the um, reviews was by David Chalmers, an up and coming uh, philosopher at the time. The idea of algorithmic processing lies at the core of modern cognitive science for good reason. Anyone who succeeds in overthrowing this idea will have affected a deep conceptual revolution in the way we think about the human mind. Penrose has given his best. Now, neuroscience in its current form, mainstream, is quite uh, physicalist or materialistic in the sense that it assumes um, uh, classical mechanics, or for the most part, uh, with some quantum at the chemistry level. So you have physics, chemistry, biology, building on the physics, neuroscience, and then some magic occurs and we have consciousness, which is um, unspecified. But is there really a good reason to think that the, the brain is actually a computer? If you look at their characteristics, they're quite different. Uh, computers rely on semiconductors like silicon or, or gallium arsenide um, and lots of other kinds of um, inorganics like uh, copper and gold, sil um, silver and so on. It's dry, it, it can, it's uh, the ones we use in our cell phones and our PCs are classical, but quantum computers are beginning to rise as well. They operate in series or parallel, but they are algorithmic only. The brain um, is based on carbon, of course, and oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and so on. Um, it's wet. It operates classically, we believe, but also may have quantum aspects to it, which I'd like to argue for in this talk. It operates massively parallel and gives out a serial output. And um, most um, neuroscientists would believe that it's algorithmic, but I think there's evidence that it is non-algorithmic in some ways. So what is an algorithm? An algorithm is simply a set of instructions. It's a set of rules that you can build into a, um, into a computer or a computer program. You have an input. The algorithm operates on the input to give you an output. So algorithmic versus non-algorithmic. Now the words computable and non-computable are often used synonymously with algorithmic and non-algorithmic. They're not precisely the same thing, for, but for our discussions they should be fine. So an algorithmic um, uh, system was one that is solvable by a Turing machine. That means um, basically a classical computer. An example with six times nine, 54. Or if you wish to distinguish pictures between a, a rhino and a giraffe, that can be done algorithmically. But there are certain non-algorithmic processes as well, which, um, for which there is no algorithm by which the solution can be reached. So for instance, determine the identity of a random number that is going to be selected in the future. 
even trying to find an algorithm that's going to identify a, a random number just a moment before it, it happens is impossible by very definition that it's random. But to do it, let's say, several days in advance would be considered impossible by any kind of algorithm. Now, whether the mind is algorithmic or non-algorithmic has been discussed for a long time. You can look back to Lucas and Lewis back uh, 60 years or more. Um, but Penrose popularized it with The Emperor's New Mind in 1989 and in following with Shadows of the Mind in 1994. He brought it to a point. And there was tremendous pushback against this, um, uh, largely by philosophers like Chalmers, who would, who would argue that the argument was not made well. It was based on Gödel's incompleteness theorems. And um, in general, I, I am sympathetic to those arguments against it, but I do believe Sir Roger is correct, but maybe not for the reasons he said. The experimental evidence for non-algorithmic processing, I believe, comes from the very nature of time and time's arrow, which we'll discuss right now. Oh, we'll be, we'll, I'll begin with <coughs> Libet's experiments. Uh, these were, uh, again, uh, discussed by Sir Roger. And um, on the left, you would see experimental data, and on the right, you can see um, a kind of idealized form of it. At time equals zero, zero mil milliseconds, one has um, um, the actual action, and then about 200 milliseconds before that, one can um, identify the awareness of the intention of doing that action. But about th uh, 350 milliseconds even earlier, about half a second before the actual action occurs, the readiness potential begins to rise. Now, Libet's experiments are a Rorschach test for neuroscientists and psychologists and so on. Many people take it to, to be an indication that we do not have free will, that the rise in the readiness potential preceding any um, actual awareness of intention indicates that we're not free agents. But there's other, other ways of interpreting this data, and that could also include backward in time effects like Sir Roger um, discussed. And under these circumstances, if one assumes retroactivity, then one can solve this, uh, this apparent problem with free will. So if one extends the idea of retroactivity to human thought and makes it more than just a half a second, one can begin to um, recognize the importance of something called precognition. Precognition is the acquisition of information about the future that should otherwise be inaccessible by normal sensory methods due to distance, shielding, or time. Thus far, precognition has been demonstrated only in biological systems. Its physical mechanism is currently debated. Now, various forms of precognition have been uh, distinguished. There is presentiment, which is primarily subconscious or non-conscious, measurable by um, external devices like EEGs, EKG, heart rate, um, uh, pupil dilation, and so on. And presentiment can um, be shown to occur uh, up to about one to 10 seconds um, uh, uh, before an actual stimulus. So this would have a time horizon of one to uh, a few seconds. Premonitions are ones which um, occur in dreams. They're mostly anecdotal. They're very difficult to control in experiments. Um, they typically have a horizon of, of a few days. <clears throat> and finally, there's one called pre, um, controlled precognition, which is both conscious and volitional. It involves sketches and verbal descriptions of unknown future targets. Um, validation can be done under control, control conditions, again, with a horizon of a few days. Now, I'd like to describe experiments that were conducted by Dale Graff and Patricia Cyrus, um, my co-author on this. And um, the precognition experiments um, will involve photographs randomly selected from large databases. There are three modalities in which this can be carried out. First is single blind. This is the case where the photograph is known to the experimenter who chooses it, but unknown to the percipient, percipient, and the photograph exists. There is the double blind experiment where the, photo, where the photograph is unknown both to the experimenter and the percipient, but the photograph still exists at the time that, the, that the, um, um, it, is, it is chosen and thirdly, there is a triple blind, which would be the gold standard. In this case, the photograph is unknown, both to the experimenter and the percipient, and the event upon which the photograph is based has not even occurred yet, and the photograph does not yet exist. So in the triple blind case, <clears throat> the, um, 
the recipient sketches, or in all of these cases, the recipient sketches and describes the target photo, and um, the session is timestamped, and the, and the results um, go to the experimenter. Um, feedback is given to the recipient at some point, and independent judge scores how close the target photo um, is to the actual description. So let's take a look first at the single blind experiment. <clears throat> These are actual experimental results. <clears throat> the, target <clears throat> the target photograph is here, um, the Lincoln Memorial. And <clears throat> in this case, the photo is known to the experiment but unknown to the recipient. Here's another photograph um, of it from a different perspective. The sketch made by the um, recipient looks like this. You can see that it looks like you have some, some sort of, looks like something like a temple. You have columns, it might be a stone hinge, but it looks more like a temple. And you can see it um, up on a hill. And the description includes the following. Hard, cool to touch, beige, columns, feels like limestone. Stone structure, water, hill. It feels as though I'm in, I am standing in a Greek or Roman temple overlooking an ocean. And that looks very much like this particular view. So under these circumstances, um, one would probably say, yes, this recipient got the target. Let's look at double blind. In this case, the photo is unknown both to the experimenter and to the recipient. The picture is here. It exists at the time of the experiment, but is unknown both to the experimenter and the recipient. It looks like the inside of a classroom, um, uh, the teacher and a bunch of students who are drawing. This is taken from the Reading Eagle in uh, Pennsylvania, a thousand miles from um, the recipient. Recipient did this in dream state, and therefore there is no sketch. But the description is telling. <coughs> it felt like we were in an art class. Female teacher, correct. Twelve students in the class, looks about right. Teacher instructing students in the use of brushes um, and hands to smudge colors, drawing small objects, purple, red color. And, and so this, is, this would be considered um, a hit as well. Now, <clears throat> this set of experiments is remarkable. This exper these experiments were, were is, this is one of 33 uh, different trials in, this, in the entire experimental series. And um, this one was triple blind. So the, the photograph was unknown both to the experimenter and the recipient, and the photo did not yet exist at the time of, of, of this experiment. The way it was conducted would be typically on a Thursday or a Friday, the experimenter would ask the recipient whether uh, she would like to carry out the experiment, and if she agreed, then the experiment would go forward. On Saturday, she would go into, she would, um, uh, go into her state to try to determine the, the, the state of this photograph, and then um, sleep on it and, and report back um, <clears throat> by, uh, by Sunday morning about what the actual photo will involve. On Monday, somewhere in the world, an event happens. It's an international event that is covered by the Associated Press. Roughly five to 10,000 photographs are given every day. One of those photographs is chosen by the Reading Eagle to publish on, on, um, in, their, in their paper on, on, um, on, on Wednesday. Um, on Tuesday, it is, it is chosen by the, um, uh, on, on excuse me, on, Tuesday, on Monday evening, it is chosen by the editor and is published Tuesday morning, and feedback is given on the, on the next day, on, the, on Wednesday. So in this particular photograph, it in, it, this is um, a picture of a ship bombing in Indonesia. Uh, you can see here you have uh, the ship and a lot of spray coming up. The boat is sunk. There are uh, people looking on from another boat, the particular event occurred on Monday, and it was described this way um, um, by, by Sunday morning. Um, it looked like this, some large curving object with some jets coming out. Massive feeling in front of me, curving metal, bow of a ship, structure, man-made, black, metal, heavy, dense feeling, water, people looking on. Thoughts of a shipwreck came to mind. So what's happening here? Well, to follow up on Sir Roger, the fundamental equations of physics are time symmetric. They, they admit both time forward and time reverse solutions. But classical reality as we know it is not that way. So 
although we have time symmetric processes that we can identify in everyday life, like let's say take, the, take an egg and throw it up and down, if I, were to, if I were to show that backward in time of it coming up and coming down, it would go up and come back down. That's time symmetric. And you're probably wondering, is this a hard boiled egg or is this a raw egg, okay? Now, the, the egg itself, as it, as it undergoes straight classical motion can be described by Newton's laws, which can easily be shown to be time symmetric. A time forward solution is the same as a time reverse solution. But when it comes to multi-particle systems, nature has something to say about that too. And that's the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of any spontaneous process is never negative. It can either be zero, as in this process, let's say, but in general, Time goes forward because the world gets messier, because entropy increases. And that gives a direction to classical time. But at a microscopic level, individual processes are time symmetric. And furthermore, individual quantum processes are time symmetric. So the, both the equations of physics would say that a time forward solution in quantum mechanics is just as good as a time backward solution, and retroactivity should not be forbidden. Now, several quantum models, in particular the two-state vector formalism, TSVF, the transactional interpretation by John Kramer, and the internal observer model, which has recently been proposed by Marcin Nowakowski this year, allow for, even demand, that time forward and time reverse solutions both be taken into account. And again, quantum time, um, individual quantum interactions are not bound by the second law. So precognition might be explainable via, via time symmetric quantum formalisms within thermodynamics. Now, if we go back for a moment, the fact that the target photograph here um, is, is determined several days, a few days before it's actually registered or ever gotten feedback from is a non-algorithmic process. There is no algorithm that can predict what that photograph was going to be. So we have then something kind of reinforcing what, what Roger was saying is that there seems to be perhaps something non-computable about, um, about nature and about, and about our realities. By the way, it was a raw egg. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Now, within the quantum thermodynamic model, um, you, you can actually meld quantum and thermodynamics together. If, if one assumes that we have a, um, in a space-time diagram, we have time along this axis and space along this axis, in something like the transactional interpretation, when something in the future happens, it sends a, what's called an advanced wave backward in time, it's, that would be given by psi star, and if there's, um, and, it, and um, if agreement is reached between the past and the future, there's a transaction which occurs between psi and psi star, which completes the interaction, and that's how reality is formed. That's very much like the way, the way Roger described it, uh, Sir Roger described it earlier. So, what about precognition? It is evidence of future influencing the past, possibly re retroactivity, or my preference, retrocausality, it is the best prima facie case, I believe, for the quantum nature of the mind and brain because there is a fixed arrow set by classical mechanics, but not by quantum mechanics. And there is, there is also a clear um, experimental evidence for the non-algorithmic nature of consciousness, at least in terms of um, something like precognition. This also suggests there might be a possibility for a new type of test where um, uh, precognition is non-algorithmic in, op in, um, in operation, therefore we hypothesize that AI in its current and foreseeable forms is incapable of it. This suggests the distinguishability test between um, humans, conscious humans, and AI. This would proceed according to a similar plan that you saw for the uh, Graf-Cyrus experiments we talked about earlier. You'd have humans and AI being tasked with determining the existence of a particular photograph, of a, of a photograph that has not been chosen yet, and then in, um, a random number is assigned to, um, a, to um, a, a number of photos in a, in a large set, and a random number generator generates a random number, and the target photo is, is chosen. 
And the critical step then is that feedback is given to the human and to the AI device. It should not be able to pass back to AI, but perhaps to humans, and therefore um, the precognition results can then be judged as to whether, um, uh, whether the target was actually reached. The expectation is that seasoned um, human recipients should describe the tar target photo roughly a th um, about a, with a high degree of accuracy of roughly a third of the time and get to the target with some degree of accuracy another third of the time, so roughly two thirds of the time. AI, virtually never. Summary and conclusions. Precognition is evidence for non-algorithmic nature of, the, of human consciousness. Um, Precognition probably is, is, um, is, good evidence, is also good evidence for retroactivity. Um, the mind and brain, um, therefore, is very likely quantum in nature in some respects. And um, quantum AI processing um, is, is algorithmic, at least currently, therefore incapable of precognition, and therefore um, cannot pass an, such a Turing test. But it also, I think, points to a, a, a deeper issue, which is that neuroscience should broaden its horizons to include um, the quantum nature of the mind, precognition, and other anomalous phenomena, and the non-algorithmic processing that seems to be um, underlying it. Um, I'd like to end, we'd like to end with uh, one observation and a couple of questions. Um, for about 10 or 15 years, um, uh, Giuseppe Cascagnoli has been um, making a good, a good case that quantum computing um, its speed up, it's the quantum speed up that's attributable to it, is due to the time forward and time reverse solutions which are operating simultaneously. Um, if that's the case, a couple of questions. First, is precognition, precognition really non-algorithmic, or is it merely algorithmic in both directions of time? Second question, will quantum AI be able to pass the precognition test and therefore foil the AI Turing test that we've described if in fact it can do both forward and reverse solutions simultaneously. Thank you. Question, Gino. Hi, what's your take on now, I, I know you're looking at algorithmic and deterministic, determinism and everything, but now if you look at these LLMs now, lar large learning uh, language models, where with things like uh, stable diffusion and everything, you're able to generate images and everything from, have you looked at, uh, you know, the, uh, it seems like if you give it some ideas and everything, it can generate a lot of things based upon the sum of the, the data that's been training it. And so, and then these arguably are also algorithmic. So um, what's your kind of take they, on where they, AI they is going today? They won't be able to pass. People. They won't be able to pass this kind of a, a, AI test. They, they cannot see forward in time that way, or that, I should say they don't, they don't get information from their own futures um, because they're classical machines. And then what's your take related to this on say intuition or insight or you know, these kind of different forms of knowing? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can vouch for the precognition. Some of these other ones, they could be deeply algorithmic, um, but when you're trying to choose a random number in the future um, that hasn't been chosen yet, that's by definition non-algorithmic. But the other ones, I don't know. Lucy. Thank you, a very interesting talk. I wanted to ask about the time symmetric uh, formulations of quantum mechanics, so something with pre and post selections, and I'm not sure that these formalisms uh, allow the transfer of information from the future to the past. I mean, you, you can do certain things with weak measurement, but I'm not sure that it actually allows the transfer of information from the future to the past. Okay. Um, what you end up with when, when you start looking at like uh, two-state vector formalism or, or transactional interpretation, you have a, an agreement, so to speak, that's between the future and the past. Calling it causation probably is incorrect. It's, it's more or less a, uh, uh, it's a correlation that's established. So um, there's nothing that forbids it at a fundamental level. And when you look at evidence like precognition, um, uh, evidence of precognition, there's, it's very difficult to explain it otherwise. So um, when you say it's information, you know, the information goes forward and backward and, it just, and, the uni and you can think of the present as, a, as an agreement between the, the past and the, and the present. Um, there's a handshake agreement. 
I'd, I'd recommend looking at a book called The Quantum Handshake by John Kramer. One of the, one of the, one of the marvelous things about uh, admitting that time goes in both directions, so to speak, is that all of the standard paradoxes in quantum mechanics, they all go away. They're non-issues. They are um, basically a misunderstanding of the nature of time. Hartman. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, uh, you presented the precognition results like it's like no questions uh, to be asked here, um, but still a bit surprising to me that this result would really exist in a statistically significant manner. So if out of a million photos um, one gets picked, you're saying uh, that, that yeah, people okay, can... Yeah, let me, let me give you some background. That, that particular one, the triple blind, which was, which was shown there, is one of 33 ind independent trials which was part of the entire experiment. Roughly 22 out of, 21 out of the 33 of those experiments were considered hits by independent judges. So statistically speaking, um, uh, it's astronomically unlikely that those could have been guessed, unless, you, unless you're claiming fraud. And, and again, there's, there are lots of other experiments that back that up. I think uh, Dean Radin will be speaking later today. He could speak very forcefully, too, in terms of presentiment experiments, which themselves are based on random number generators, too, uh, whereas the random number generator picks the, the, the photo at, at the moment it's being shown, and yet there's a presentiment kind of effect um, you know, half a second or so, or a second in advance. Um, BEMS experiments, similarly. So the, the bulk of the evidence says something, something interesting is going on. It's just, not just coincidence. All right, let's uh, thank Daniel for a great talk.